The Young Facing the Two Roads of Life by St. Paisios of Manathos Married life and monastic life are both blessed. Yerenda, what should one say to young people who ask if monastic life is superior to married life? To begin with, one must help them understand what the destiny of man is and what the meaning of life is. Then one can explain to them that both roads indicated by our church are blessed because each can lead them to paradise if they abide by the will of God. Let's say that two people start out on a pilgrimage. One takes the bus using the public road and the other goes on foot along some trail. Both have the same goal. God rejoices in the one and marvels at the other just the same. It would be bad if he who goes on foot criticizes the other who takes the bus, or vice versa. Those young people who may be thinking about monasticism should know that the mission of the monk or the nun is a very high calling. It is to become an angel. In the next life, in heaven, we will live like angels, Jesus Christ had told the Sadducees. This is why some very philotimo-filled young people become monks or nuns and embark on their angelic life from this present life. But let no one think that those who go to the monastery will be saved simply because they became monks or nuns. Each person will account to God about whether he sanctified the path of life he chose. Philotimo is needed everywhere. God does not make deserving or undeserving people, but anyone who doesn't have this spirit of Philotimo, no matter what path of life he follows, will be undeserving. On the contrary, the Philotimo-filled man will make progress wherever he may be, because divine grace is with him. There are married people who live most virtuously and are sanctified. The head of a household who loves God and is drawn by divine eros can make great spiritual progress. In the meantime, they can endow their children with virtues, create a good family, and receive a double reward from God. This is why every young person should aim to struggle in life with philotimo and without anxiety in order to sanctify his or her chosen path of life. Do they prefer marriage? Then they ought to wed, but they should struggle to be good spouses and live a holy life. Do they prefer monastic life? Then they should choose monastic life, but they must struggle to become a good monk or nun. One must weigh and assess his strengths, understand his limitations, before embarking on one of the two ways of life. If, for example, a young woman can see that she doesn't have the strength needed to become a nun, then she can humbly say to God, My Lord, I am weak. I cannot live as a nun. Please send me a good man who can help me so that we create a good family and live a spiritual life. God will not abandon her. If she chooses to marry and create a good family, if she lives in accordance with the gospel, God will not ask for more from her. Of course, there are those young people from whom God only asks a few things, but they, out of Philotimo, struggle more and offer him far beyond what he asks of them by choosing the monastic life. They will receive a double crown. This means that if a soul is inclined toward the married life and, out of much Philotimo, sacrifices everything to follow the monastic life, their Philotimo moves God exceedingly but they must make sure their motives are pure and completely free of pride. From that point on, God will dispel all hardships. Anxiety in getting settled. Yerenda, is the anxiety felt by a young person over getting settled in life caused by a lack of belief? Not always. Often, young people who are concerned about how to best arrange their lives, but also want to be close to God, become anxious about getting settled. This indicates a healthy attitude. When the young remain unconcerned and don't think about how to best arrange their life, an indifferent person is revealed, and it follows that an indifferent person will also be a good-for-nothing person. The young only have to be careful not to allow this anxiety to overcome them, giving the devil the opportunity to lead them into a state of agonizing distress that will keep their mind in a state of constant confusion. The young have to entrust themselves to God in order to live in peace, because the good God works and takes action as a loving father, exactly where we humans cannot act. They need not rush into making immature decisions about which life they will follow. I know of young people who are striving too hard and are trying to solve all their problems at once. In the end, they get confused and abandon their studies. For instance, they get extremely anxious over what to do in life while they're still in college. They delay their studies and become even more confused. Everything can't be done at the same time, nor are problems solved this way. To be helped, they must do a thorough cleaning inside and put things in proper order. First, they have to concentrate on getting their degree, then on getting a job. The young men should also complete their military service. After this, with maturity and the help of God, they can either raise a good family if they choose married life, or go to a monastery of their choice if they decide in favor of the monastic life. This is why I say to the young, who are students and who have such anxiety, that since they have not yet matured in their thinking as to what they will do in life, the best thing to do is continue their studies. 
Later on, they should pursue what has matured within them and brings them peace. If there is a good disposition, God will help them, and it will gradually become clear which life is for them, married life or monastic life in a monastery, and they will be at peace with their choice. Let us help the young follow their inclination. Every person has an inclination. The good God created humans to be free. God has a noble spirit. He has absolute respect for this freedom of people and allows each one to follow the road that will bring them inner peace. God does not force us all onto the same line with military discipline. This is why the young should allow themselves to be free within the spiritual space of the freedom of God. It doesn't do them any good to examine which life, married or monastic, will follow, or which will be followed by someone else. When it comes to this matter of choice, they shouldn't be influenced by anybody else other than themselves. Again, the parents, the spiritual fathers, and the teachers ought to help the young to select a vocation in line with their capabilities and to follow their natural inclination, without influencing them or strangling that inclination. The decision about which life they will follow has to be their own. The rest of us can only express simple opinions, and the only right we have is to help these souls find their way in life. Sometimes when I talk with young people who are concerned over these matters, I can see which way the scale is tipping, but I won't say anything because I don't want to influence them. The only thing I try to do is to help them as much as I can to discover the right path and inner peace. I remove whatever is harmful from that which gives them peace, so that what remains is the good, the holy, so that they live this life joyfully by being close to God and live even more joyfully in the other life. Honestly, no matter which life is followed by a young person, I know, I will rejoice and will always have the same concern for the salvation of his soul, as long as he's with Christ in our church. I will feel like a brother to him because he will be a child of our mother, the church. Of course, I do feel a particular joy for those who follow the monastic life, because the one who follows this angelic way of living is truly wise, because he escapes the hook of the devil, which has the world as its bait. But you cannot put all the people into the same mold. You see, Christ did not introduce monasticism as a commandment, even though it is the road to perfection, because he did not wish to impose such a heavy burden upon everyone. This is why when the young man asked him how he could be saved and have eternal life, Christ answered, Keep the commandments. And when the young man said that he had kept them and went on to ask, What lack I yet? Then Christ said, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and come and follow me. In other words, whenever Jesus encountered a person with philotomo, he would speak about perfection, he did not wish to place a noose around people's necks, nor did he preach about monasticism, for then he would have set a fire such that perhaps many would have run undiscerningly to become monks, which would have resulted in harm. He only set the spark, and when the appropriate time had come, monasticism came into existence. Likewise, we do not have the right to force others. If they want, they can force themselves on their own accord. We only have the right to force ourselves, and even that with discernment. So far, I have never told any young person either to get married or to become a monk. If someone asks me, I say, do whatever it is that brings you peace, as long as you are with Christ. And if someone tells me that he is not at ease and at peace in the world, then I will speak about monasticism to help him find his way. Deciding on a way of life. The years pass by quickly. It wouldn't be good for a young person to remain undecided for too long at the crossroads of life. A cross must be chosen one of the two paths of our church, in accordance with the individual's inclination and personal philotomo, and then to proceed with trust in Christ. Let each person follow Christ to the crucifixion, if one desires to rejoice in the resurrection. There are bitter hardships in both ways of life, but if one remains close to God, sweet Jesus will sweeten them. Once a person is past the age of 30, it becomes more difficult to make a decision, and it becomes even more difficult as the years pass. A young person can adapt more readily to whichever lifestyle is chosen. Older persons will rationalize everything as their character has already been formed, and they don't easily adapt to change. The concrete has been poured. You see, those who settle down at an early age, either in married or monastic life, maintain a childlike simplicity right through old age and get along easily with others. I knew a couple who got married young. They were so much alike in the way they interacted. Each had adapted to the habits of the other early on, in the way they spoke, the way they behaved, they were most compatible with each other. The proverb says, either get married young or become a monk young. Young women especially should decide on a path of life by the time they reach the age of 25. After that age, it becomes more difficult for a woman to get married 
because she thinks that she will have to submit to someone else. In the meantime, as she grows older, she acquires peculiar habits, and then who would have her? Then she will be seeking marriage primarily for security and protection, rather than for creating a family. It is a well-known observation that whoever constantly postpones marriage will search after many years have passed, but not find a suitable spouse. When someone is young, he can choose for himself. Later in life, he becomes a merely possible choice for others. This is why I say that on this matter, there is need for a little craziness. Overlook some things which are not essential, because no one can have everything come out as expected. Once it began to rain and a downhill torrent started, carrying a lot of water. An impetuous person and a prudent person wanted to cross over the torrent to the other side. The prudent person said, The rain will eventually stop, the water will subside, and then I'll cross over. The impetuous one did not wait. He made a run for it and crossed over to the other side. He got a little wet, but he reached his destination. In the meantime, the rain, instead of stopping, intensified, and the water in the torrent increased to a dangerous level. In the end, the prudent person was unable to cross over to the other side. There are some people who have tremendous pride, a lot of egoism, and this is why God doesn't help them. For years, some people kept coming to the Kalavi, asking me, Dear Father, what does God want from me? As if God has any need of them. They didn't get married and they didn't become monks. It's as if they're made of gold and are fearful of being placed like an iron reinforcement rod in cement. Then there are others who tell me, Yerenda, what should I do? Should I become a monk or should I get married? Tell me, where do I belong? So I ask them, what is it that you want? And they tell me, well, both are very desirable to me. They want to have both. Now, if I tell them my thoughts, for example, that they are more suitable for married life, and they do get married, they may end up not being happy and will come back to me afterwards to tell me, you told me to follow this path of life, and now I am tormented by it. Yerenda, how can this happen? Let's say that a young man has an inclination towards married life, but is also thinking of monastic life. If he is not careful so as to create a good family, and later on ends up with a score of problems that he doesn't resolve spiritually, then the evil one will attack him with various thoughts such as, You were meant for the monastic life, but since you got married you deserve to suffer. The devil will not leave him at peace, he will attack him with such thoughts day and night. Some people don't know what they are looking for. Just a few years ago a young woman came here to tell me, Yerinda, I can't decide which path to follow in life. I want to get married, but I'm also thinking of monastic life. What should I do? I told her, consider what puts you more at peace and choose that. I just don't know, she told me. But sometimes it seems to me that I am more inclined toward marriage. Please tell me what to do. Well then, if you feel more inclined to marry, I finally told her, it is better to marry, and God will provide for you. With your blessing, Yerinda, this is what I will do, she told me, and went away. Well, today she came to tell me, Yerinda, I got married. I married a man in the Merchant Marine, a good man, glory be to God. I can't complain, but I am very much troubled. I suffer because for six months we live together, and for six months apart. He spends half a year traveling on the ship. My blessed soul, I responded, didn't you tell me that you loved both the married life and the monastic life? Well, now you have both. Why don't you just glorify God for this arrangement? But today, Yerinda, we live in difficult times, and some young people are reluctant to have a family. No, this is not an appropriate way to face the circumstances of our times. If there is trust in Christ, they have nothing to fear. Were not the years of persecution difficult in the early church? Did the Christians then stop having families? We have so many saints who were martyred for the faith, together with their wives and children. Studies and Getting Settled Yerinda, many young people have difficulty continuing their studies, for they have not decided which way of life they will follow. This issue constantly preoccupies them, and they cannot concentrate on their studies. When a young person has such problems, I tell him, You know those huge refrigerators people now have? Well, just put this concern of yours inside one of those refrigerators until you have completed your studies. I'm not telling you to throw away this concern. Just put it inside the refrigerator until you're done with your studies. If you don't focus on your studies now, your friends will get settled, they'll be calmed down, and then they will be praying for you to get settled. Young people need to be very careful, because it's a trick of the enemy to distract them. Yerinda, I told a young woman, if you are thinking of getting married, do not go to college. And what is she supposed to do until she gets married? Sell sweets? She should get a degree or learn some technical skill, because something might come up in life, and she will need to put those skills to use. Another young girl told me once, I am thinking of monasticism, but am constantly changing my mind. What grade are you in? I asked her. I'm a sophomore in high school, she said, but I don't want to go to college. You don't want to go to college? I asked. Then I will tell your father to get you some goats and a sheepdog to protect them. 
even to get you a shepherd's flute to play while they pasture. Would you like that? Look, try to go to college or learn some trade at least. Then Yerinda, she said, until I decide to become a nun or to get married, I would rather stay in the monastery as a pre-novice nun and learn the art of humility. You can practice this art in your own home by joyfully accepting what your parents tell you. First, you have to finish high school. Then you will take your college entrance examinations. And when you're finished with your studies there, we will see what you can do. But Yerinda, five years, isn't that a long time to wait before deciding? Yes, it is a long time, but what can we do since you have not yet settled on anything? Then she asked me, is this my fault? Is it because I'm undecided? No, but right now the scale isn't tipping either in one direction or the other. In cases like these, we must emphasize to the young people that they mustn't waste their time. They should live as spiritually as possible for the duration of their studies, get their degree, which is essential, in good time, and then God will provide. Meanwhile, they should have a good spiritual father to keep them from getting too excited over one path or the other, and also to keep them from falling into despair. They should be patient until they finish their studies, and then, having gained more maturity and skills, they can then clearly decide on which path to follow and do the best they can, glorifying God throughout their life. The way the world is today, the more mature they become, the better it is. Have you any idea what strange things are happening out there? Especially when someone is overly enthusiastic about something, it is very important to be careful not to make any immature decisions. Yerinda, there are some young people who have no appetite for their studies because they prefer spiritual study and prayer. No, they must not abandon their studies. Along with their studies, they can also read something important from the spiritual writings of the fathers of the church. They can pray a little, do some prostrations, and maintain their spiritual life intact. Whenever they have a lot of studying to do, they can take occasional breaks to say the Jesus prayer or to chant. For if they rush to do something that is best left for later, they won't be able to accomplish anything because they'll be thinking of their studies, and this will, in turn, have a negative impact on their studies. So in the end, they will accomplish nothing. But if they study, they will be able to get their degree on time, and then they'll be free to do what they want. When I was at the sanatorium for a few days, I wasn't able to pray, make prostrations, or keep a fast. I just ate whatever they gave me. I thought to myself, I ought to help the doctors do their job in helping me get well quickly, and afterwards, I can do what I want. Children come to me and complain that their parents pressure them a great deal to study. Now, if I also pressure them, I won't be of any help. So, in order to help them understand why they have to continue to study, I give them examples of children who didn't study and paid the price, along with examples of children who did study and were successful. Here's an example. There were two boys going to the same school and living in the same neighborhood. The first one was very smart. With very little effort, he got excellent grades, straight A's throughout elementary and middle school. The second one wasn't as bright, but he was able to keep up with the first one by being very diligent in his studies. When the first boy finished the first grade of high school, he got involved with bad company, dropped out of school, and in the end had to go to work in a company as a janitor. He got married, had two children, and it became very difficult for him to make ends meet. The other boy continued his studies, went to law school, went to Europe for graduate studies, and earned a degree in business management. One day at the company where the first fellow was working, they were waiting for a new boss to arrive. Everyone was saying how educated he was, and in the end the new boss ended up being his former classmate. He recognized him the moment he saw him. The janitor became so depressed that he even tried to kill himself a couple of times. Someone told him to come and find me on Mount Athos. After talking to me about his life, he exclaimed over the final surprise, Can you imagine that I have him as my boss? I then gave him a thorough scolding and told him, You could have been more successful than your friend. You and your children would have been much better off than you are now, and you would even be in a position to help others. As if it wasn't enough that you make your family suffer, you now want to kill yourself, leave your children orphans, and destroy your family? I don't feel sorry for you. You brought this on yourself. But I do feel sorry for your poor children. Do you understand? So try to be patient, and I believe that with God's help, even the new boss will be kind to you. He may even give you a better job. And if you are not at peace there, go and find another job elsewhere. Don't leave your children in the streets. That shook him up, and he pulled himself together. That's why I always say, if the young who are students are diligent, and even get a little tired during their studies, they will not fall behind. They will graduate on time and won't have worries later. I've noticed that those students who procrastinated during their studies tend to start procrastinating and owing work or money again even after they graduate, and they have nothing but problems. Yerinda, if a young person establishes a serious relationship with another during the course of their studies, is it wise to create a family while they are still in school? I think that the relationship, however good, will be detrimental to their studies. 
Even if one finds a good woman and gets married, it will be a very difficult time for both the wife and the children. It would be better if he focused his spiritual and physical strengths on his studies and finished them without exhausting himself before taking on family life. Otherwise, his strengths will be too thinly spread and he will be constantly spiritually and physically exhausted. The spiritual life is the basic prerequisite to a good marriage. Yerinda, the young lady who told you that she is thinking about becoming a nun, told me that a male classmate of hers asked her why she doesn't go to the cinema and why she doesn't go out with boys. What should she have answered him? She should have told him, you're asking me something that not even my brother would ask. A few days later, the young man came up behind her outside of school. She hadn't noticed him, and he grabbed her by the shoulder. She merely said hello and went straight inside. No, she shouldn't have done that. In this instance, she should have reacted because her stance may have given him the impression that she accepted his act, encouraging him to do it again. She is now at a very difficult age to be keeping company with boys. She doesn't need to talk with them, as if to help them. And if she decides to create a family, whenever she meets a good young man, she should consult with her parents. They can ascertain if he has the foundations needed to create a good family. But now that she has not yet decided which way of life she will follow, it does not help her to be talking to boys, something which will only confuse her unnecessarily and cause her to lose her serenity. The young who are preoccupied with such things are very disoriented and troubled. They can't find inner peace. There's turmoil in their faces and in their eyes. Sexual attraction between a man and a woman is very natural, but you must tell this young woman that now is not the time for that. She has to focus on her studies. Children who become aware of this attraction and cultivate it from an early age turn the button onto this subject before the appropriate time. And later, when that time does come, the button will have already been turned on, and they won't be able to enjoy it because they will have experienced that joy before its time. Whereas the young who are careful with these matters now will enjoy married life all the more when the suitable time comes, and until then will have much peace and serenity. Do you notice some mothers who have lived a virtuous life? How peaceful they are, even in spite of having so many family cares. I always emphasize that young people should try to live as spiritually as they can before marriage since preserving their chastity secures their physical and spiritual health. The spiritual life is a basic prerequisite to whatever life one chooses. The world has become like a wheat field that is ready for the harvest, but swine enter and trample it. So now everything is in disarray, weeds, mud, wheat stalks, but here and there, on some edge, there is an occasional wheat stalk standing upright. The more spiritual work one does during his youth, the easier it will be for him in all things later in life no matter which path is chosen. The better equipped and prepared one is before the battle, the better off he will be when bullets are flying and bombs are falling. Until the time comes for a young woman to decide if she wants to be a nun or a fine mother, it is necessary that she live a pure life. That's why she has to try her best to succeed in her studies. The more careful she is to protect her eyes and ears and dispel unseemly thoughts, the less of these thoughts and images she will have to discard later. The same is true for young men, when a young man meets a nice young lady, he should try to have good thoughts. He should view her as a living icon of a saint. Or if he should meet someone who has gone astray, he ought to view her as his sister and feel sorry for her, just as he would if she were indeed his sister, for we are all children of Adam. But Yerinda, nowadays there are so many temptations for a young person in college and everywhere else. A young person ought to keep company with other spiritually mature young people in order to be helped and move within a spiritual atmosphere. Let's not make things more difficult than they are. I know a lot of young men and women who are going to college and are living a pure and chaste life through their own small effort and with the great help of our loving God.